The Bible says that the Lord gives his people strength and the Lord blesses them with peace. Look at your neighbor this morning and say, the Lord will give you strength. Now say, the Lord will give you peace. The, those of you sitting by yourself, look at me. The Lord will give you strength and grace and peace for those that are by yourselves today. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Join me in prayer, and if you're watching from at home, welcome. As Pastor Corey said a few moments ago, I want you to pray with me this morning too. Father, thank you on this Palm Sunday as we gather in your name to worship you. We ask, Holy Spirit of God, bless us with strength, bless us with peace, and if in any way we lack that at all, Lord, I pray you will fill our cup to overflowing as we look at these truths together. For it's in Christ's name I pray. And everyone said, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. You know, every one of us in this room, all of you, every single person, myself included, we all need strength. Can you say amen to that? We all need energy. How many can raise your hand and say, I need energy today? Though, <laughs> the tick says he needs a lot. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're lying. All of you need energy this morning. All of us need peace. All of us need someone to come along and give us that attaboy, girl on our backs. Every one of us in this room, we could use more faith. We could use more hope. We could use more optimism. I would dare say that every single one of us in this room, including myself, we could use more of a positive mental attitude. Can you say amen to that? And that comes from knowing and ingesting the Word of the Lord. As a pastor, and I've been a pastor now for almost 50 years, as a pastor, one of the things that I have seen in people's lives is that most of the people that I have pastored over the years, they have their functional needs met. They have a home, they have a job, a retirement, they have some sort of income, they have food in their refrigerators. I have gone overseas into third world countries that are very poor, and even there I've seen people with shelter, it may not have been very much, and then I've met those who, who've had shelter, they've had some food, they've had some resources, they have their functional needs met, and then occasionally you meet those that are what are called castaways or cast off in society. They're crippled, they're lame, they're maimed in some societies, and they're, they're finding shelter on the doorsteps of a home, or they're finding shelter in a sewer. I've ministered to those people not only overseas, but in places that would surprise you here in America. But we have our daily needs met. In his wonderful book, People Fuel, Dr. John Townsend says, though, that most of us we're lacking relational nutrients. Say that phrase with me. Relational nutrients. Say that one more time. Relational nutrients. I really like that phrase. I really like that book. Relational nutrients. You know, as I've gotten older, I've always had to take medicine because of my medical background all my life. And I've never had a problem with my faith and, and medicine. You know, that doesn't have any conflict for me. But as I've gotten older, I've learned to take more vitamins. And is anybody like me in here? You take vitamins and you take supplements and they're, they're nutri I try to eat very, very healthy, but at the same time, I, I do. I, I get, when I take my medicine at night, I throw in these vitamins and I throw in these nutrients and I'm fortunate enough that I can down them all with one big gulp of water and I'm done at one time. And I've seen others, it's one at the time and they act like it's killing them, you know, and I was thinking I would rather die than have to go through that. But I gulp it all down at one time because I'm getting the physical nutrients that I need, but as I as I read the Word of God this week, and as I was looking at and preparing for Good Friday service, there was a passage of Scripture that really stood out to me and brought back that phrase, relational nutrients. Because many of us, and I dare say in this room this morning, and the online, many of us don't have anybody to cheer us on. A lot of us don't have anybody to guide us. A lot of us don't have anybody to give us that out of boy or out of girl outside of perhaps our spouse or maybe one best friend. But Dr. Townsend says in that book, we all need a group of friends around us. And Jesus was marvelous as that. There was the multitudes, then there was the 70, then there were the 12, 
Then there were the three, and then there was the one. You can see Jesus' circles of relationship of friends that he had. And it's very important that we learn from the life and the example of Jesus. Occasionally, somebody will come to me and say, well, I really don't need a group of friends. I don't need a small group. And I'm not preaching about small groups this morning, but I met somebody for lunch at Panera to talk to them about the value of being in a small group. And after we ate, we stepped outside and looked at me, and he says, I'm just going to be honest with you. I think that God and I have got this under control. I don't need a small group. And I remember looking at him, and I didn't have time to share this story in the first service, but looking at him, I says, you know, there's either pride that you don't want to admit it, or there's shame that there's something going on in your life that you don't want somebody else to know about that can help you overcome it, or there's fear you've been hurt before. And I will never forget this man looking at me, this businessman looking at me and saying, you're right, I've been hurt. I tried being in a small group of people, and they took what I shared and shared it with others. I want to tell you that's not a friend. And that's not the way small groups work at Woodland Church. And it's very important as I go through this message for you to get the maximum benefit out of it. I just want to be honest with you. You need to listen to this message again online. And then you need to listen to it a third time. You need to carefully go through these notes. And you need to soak this word up. Don't let pride, don't let shame, don't let fear keep you from experiencing the peace and the strength that God has for you. We all need that vertical relationship. There's a strength that only God can give us. There's a peace that only God can give us. We find our identity in Christ. We all need that vertical relationship. But Jesus not only revealed to us what God was like, but Jesus revealed to us what our relationships with one another should be like as he lived his life upon this earth. That's what the incarnation was all about. Not just to show us what God was like, but to show us what life with one another could be like. The Bible says in Genesis 2, it's not good for man or for woman to be alone. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, woe to those people who fall down and have no one to help them up or pick them up or lift them up. Now, here are two words that you might want to write down who help me, that help me when it comes to defining relationships. Those words are drain and gain. Say that with me. Drain and gain. I didn't hear you, so let's try it again. Drain and gain. Thank you. See, there are some relationships that I leave, I just feel so diminished, I don't feel replenished. I hear the complaint, the whining, the griping, the co- all this kind of stuff, and it's very, very diminishing. But then there are other relationships, like I had three different meals with three different people yesterday, and after every one of those meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I left feeling refreshed. I left, actually, can I just be honest with you? I know this is going to sound very vain and cocky, but Pastor Corey, I walked out feeling like I was one of the smartest people in the world. I was one of the wisest people in the world. I was one of the most successful people in the world, and that's the secret of a person who knows how to build you up and to encourage you and help you grow. There have been other meals I've walked away from or meetings, and I've like, I am the dumbest person in the world. I am the biggest failure. I am never, I don't know anything. Those are those draining type of relationships. Let me take you back a decade ago when I was so sick. Many of you, some of you in this room, not all of you, but some of you in the room, you were part of the church then and in the second service as well, in the first service as well. But there were people that would come and just sit in the hospital with me. I had five major surgeries in three years, kept getting sick. I nearly died. I lost over 50 pounds. I've never been large to begin with. But I I, I remember somebody walking in and just bursting out in tears when they saw me. But they, people that would sit there, and Pastor Corey, they would lay their hands on my arm. Some would lay their hand on my leg. And they would just sit there an hour sometime, just praying quietly, praying inside. I didn't have to talk with them. They didn't try to talk with me. They just sat with me. And I drew strength from that. And then there were other people that came during that time, and it was a difficult time. There were people who came in and said they didn't like something a staff member was doing in my absence and said, if you don't fire them, then I'm leaving the church. I'm quitting the church. I'm going to tell other people why, and I'd have tubes come. And say, I'm not going to fire them. I had other people come in, and they thought because I was sick, I didn't have any faith. And so they would come in and tell me, you know, I didn't have faith and they couldn't trust a pastor that was sick and so they would leave the church. I had other people come in and 
They brought in their resumes and says, I need you to help me find a job. There were people that I found jobs for. Then they would come in and tell me, you know, they were going to leave the church. There were people that were draining me. And I remember the doctors and the nurses coming in one day and saying, if you don't put a stop to these people coming into your room, they're draining life out of you. We're trying to save your life, and they're sucking life out of you. So remember those two words, drain and gain. There were people who would build up and encourage, and then there were people that were like spiritual and emotional vampires. I was, I was friends, he's in heaven now, with the pastor of a very large church, very successful church. I have a whole file of stuff, of things that I collected from him that he encouraged me with. But his church got to the place it was so big that he could no longer be accessible to everyone. And, and he had been hurt through the years. And I remember he was talking to me. He had this magnificent study. It was half the size of this sanctuary. And I, I, just this magnificent study. And we're sitting there one day, and he's telling me about some of the struggles and struggles that he was going with. I preached for him frequently. And I asked him one day, Pastor, who, is your, who are your friends and he shared something with me I'll never forget. And it was a life lesson. I have taught this leadership lesson all across America. I've taught it overseas. He said to me, I have been hurt so many times by people that I led into my life, and they have taken what I have shared with them, and they've hurt me with it, that the only people I let close to me are my wife and my son now. And friends, that is not what the church is all about about. And that's part of what I want to talk to you about this morning. Because all of this became real to me looking at the scriptures as I was preparing for Palm Sunday today. God's promise for how he gives us peace and strength. Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He came through the eastern gate that is all walled up now, that his enemies have bricked up and walled up because, you know, when the Muslims controlled Jerusalem, they decided to brick it up because of the prophecies that Messiah would come through that eastern gate. And I want to tell you something. When Jesus comes again, ain't no wall going to hold Jesus back. Can you say amen to that? But Jesus came riding in on a donkey, as was prophesied by the prophets, and the children and the people were lining the streets going, Hosanna, Hosanna. Last week, Becky was talking about this to the children in Children's Church, and one of the kids spoke up and said, Miss Becky, it was a Jesus parade. <laughs> Isn't that cool? A Jesus parade. Jesus is walking, is, is riding through. But the whole reason Jesus came was so that he could go to Calvary to die for your sins and my sins. He, the whole reason he came was because he knew he would give his life for us so that we could be born again. But in between that entrance into Jerusalem and between the cross, Jesus takes some friends of his with him to the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26 and verse 38, and Jesus told them these words, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Now catch that, those phrases real carefully. My soul is crushed to the point of death. Have you ever been there? Have you ever lost a spouse to death or divorce? Have you ever had a son or a daughter that's turned their back upon you and said they don't love you anymore? Have you ever lost your career or lost your health? Have you ever felt that deep in your spirit? My soul is crushed with grief to the very point of death where you wish that you could die. Have you ever been to that point where you just wish that you could die? A number of years ago, I was in Montgomery, Alabama, and there I, was, I went to hear a man speak that I had been invited to come here and speak, and we had dinner together afterwards, and we were talking about grief and how it affected people and it impacted people, and he told me a story I've never forgot. His name was Judson Cornwall. Some of you may have heard of his name, but Judson said, I, I was so overwhelmed and I was so crushed with grief that I really wanted to die. And he said, I was in a speaking event, and another man that I had a lot of respect for by the name of David Tuplessy came up to him and said, J Judson, I've been praying for you. And he said, I felt like the Lord said this to me to share with you. He's heard you that you want to die. And if you want to die, God will bring you home. But God is not finished with you yet. 
And Judson went on to have a powerful, powerful ministry. And I want to say to you this morning that if somehow or another your soul feels like it's crushed to death and you want to die, God is not finished with you. Whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian this morning, God is not finished with you. God has a wonderful plan with your life. And going through these times, it's not unusual for Christians. Look at what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. God who knows how, who always knows how to encourage the depressed, encouraged us greatly by the arrival of Titus. Now, I want you to compare these two experiences. Jesus is in the garden. He asks his friends to stay awake with him. He doesn't ask them to talk to him. He doesn't ask them to have conversation. He just wants his friends to be present with him. But they went to sleep, and rather than be present with him, they gave in to their fatigue. They gave in to how tired they were. But on the other hand, when Paul is at this same place and he's depressed, somebody comes into his life and he causes Paul to gain. He causes the church to gain. There are people like that in our lives that when they come into their lives, we're replenished, we're built up, we're not diminished. Something about their presence in our life, they don't have to say a lot, they're just there and they build us up in our holy faith. Here are four lessons I'd like us to take away from this. Number one, Learn how to be present with one another without having to say a word. Learn how to be present with one another without having to say a word. You know, some of the most beautiful evenings that Becky and I have enjoyed is when we've just been together and there hasn't been a lot of conversation. And I love to talk with her. We have wonderful conversations, interesting conversations. But sometimes those nights when I've read and she sat beside me reading or working on a, a Sudoku puzzle or something like that, we've just been together. Do you know what I'm talking about in a, in a marriage where you're just together? You're with one another. Sometimes being with a friend and just, just hiking together. And you're not saying a lot, but you're enjoying being outdoors. You're climbing the mountain. You're crossing the stream. You're, you're enjoying things. And maybe every once in a while you say, but you're just together. You're present with one another. And especially when you're suffering, you need somebody just to be present with you. When you're going through a trial, you need somebody just to support you and encourage you and to be present with you. When you read the book of Job, it's not that what Job's friends, there's a lot of wisdom in what Job's friends says. When I read the words they say, I can go through various scriptures and say, yes, this is true. Yes, this is true. But it didn't apply to Job's life because they were diminishing Job by accusing Job of sinning. They were diminishing Job by judging Job. They were diminishing Job by, by believing the worst about him. And Job said, it would be better for you to leave than to be here with me, condemning me. How much better if his friends had just learned to be present with Job, be quiet with Job. The Bible tells us is exactly what Jesus did for us. When he was born for us, the Bible says, the angel said, they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. I find it remarkable that Jesus didn't start his ministry until he was 30 years old. I preached my first sermon when I was 16 years old. I can't believe that there was a church that actually wanted me to come and preach when I was 16 years old. Charles Spurgeon was a pastor when he was 17 years old. Can you imagine a 17-year-old kid being your pastor? But Jesus was present with people. He, he saw his father die, Joseph. He, he worked as a carpenter. He knew what it was like to be a part of a rejected people group, a despised people group. He knew what it was like to, to live in poverty. He knew what it was like to be gossiped about. And yet he loved people and he lived with people. He was present with them before he began his ministry. He not only showed us what God was like in the vertical relationship, but he showed us how to live and not become bitter and hate the people who had heard him. It's the reason the Bible says in Proverbs 17 and verse 17 that a friend is always loyal. Say that with me. A friend is always loyal. Say it again. A friend is always loyal. If you're not always loyal, you're not a friend. If you break the trust of someone that you call friend, you've not been a friend. Now, being loyal doesn't mean that you're not willing to confront a friend privately. Being loyal doesn't mean that you're not willing to define reality for them, but you're going to be there with them 
all the way through as you define reality. Does that make sense? Do you follow what I'm saying? So a friend is always loyal. A friend will always speak up for you. A friend will always have your back. A friend will always be there with you. A friend just basically does for you, you do for a friend what you wish somebody would do for you. That's how you measure friendship. The Bible says in Romans 15, 7, honor God by accepting each other as Christ has accepted you. Now, think about this carefully. Look at it. Let's read it out loud. Honor God by accepting each other as Christ has accepted you. That says two things to me. That Christ went deep into our lives by accepting us. He took our sins upon himself. And he went wide in our lives by saying, I will always be with you. Yesterday morning at breakfast, I told someone that I was meeting with, I said, listen, I love the prayer. It's a wonderful prayer. Christ around me, Christ above me, Christ beneath me. But the greatest truth is this, that Christ is within me. Christ lives in me. He lives in you, the hope of glory. You say, Pastor, it's difficult to live like that. I can tell you it's difficult to live like that. It means you have to simplify your life. You have to declutter your life. You have to learn to listen like Jesus listened to people rather than always wanting to give advice or always want to tell them what to do. And you say, Pastor, how do I do this? You learn to spend time with Jesus in prayer and worship. And people sometimes say to me, Pastor, will you teach me how to pray? And I said, I will teach you if you'll come to church on Sundays. Because when you come to church, we agree with one another as we pray together. When Pastor Corey led us in prayer this morning, we're, we're listening to Pastor Corey. We're agreeing for healing. We're agreeing for comfort. We're, we're learning how to pray as Pastor Corey prayed. We're learning how to discern the body of Christ as Pastor Corey led us through taking communion. We're hearing the word of the Lord this morning preached, and we're praying the Word of God back. And that doesn't mean we always like the Word of God. We may be skeptical about something we hear in the Word of God. We may be angry about something we hear in the Word of God. We may be fearful about something. We may be hopeful. We may be joyous. We may be going, yes, yes, yes. But all of those emotions and feelings, we pray them back to God. God calls that prayer. That's the reason the Psalms are so meaningful to us. So if you want to learn how to be present with people, learn You not only need the vertical time, but you have to go deep and wide with people by spending time with them. So can I ask you this question? Who is present with you? Who can you count on to walk with you through life? I'm not talking about your husband or your wife. I'm not talking about your just one best friend. But what's that small group of people relationally that are always present with you? Number two. Give grace to one another. Give grace to one another. Grace is when God gives me what I don't deserve. Grace is when God gives me what I don't deserve. Grace is when, mercy is when God withholds what I do deserve. How many of you have been recipients of mercy? How many of you have been recipients of God's grace? You see, He gives me what I don't deserve, but he withholds what I do deserve. He gave what I do deserve. He gave it to Jesus. So if you watch The Passion of Christ, as I hope you will do this week, I'll be blogging about that tomorrow. If you watch The Passion, I hope you'll remind yourself that what Christ took upon himself, what Mel Gibson was shown in that movie, is what your sins and my sins deserve. But it still wouldn't have done any good. You see, I find my identity in Jesus, not in my vocation, I find my identity in Jesus, not in my ministry. I find my identity in Christ. That's why being in Christ is so important. I understand what love is because when I read 1 Corinthians 13, it moves beyond that ethereal concept of love is patient, love is kind, love is encouraging, love rejoices in truth. It moves beyond that. I see that modeled in the life of Jesus. And I see how Jesus demonstrated that vertically. I see how Jesus demonstrated that horizontally. And when God wants to define his riches, now now listen, get this. When God wants to define his riches, this is what he says. Look with me at Ephesians 1 verse 7. He is so rich and kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. 
Maybe you're a well-to-do parent and you gave your son or daughter a car. You gave them an education. Out of your wealth, you were able to do that for them. Maybe you couldn't afford to do that for your children, but you gave them a loving home. You provided a table and shelter for them. But when God wants to define his riches for us, God doesn't talk about the earth. God doesn't talk about food. God doesn't talk about silver. God doesn't talk about gold. God doesn't talk about wealth or fame or fortune. God defines his wealth that he purchased us with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Can we give him a hand of praise this morning? That's the wealth of God's love for you and me. And out of that, we understand how Jesus loved, affirmed, encouraged, energized, inspired people to faith and hope and love. The Bible even goes so far as to say this, that glorious speech is like clover honey, good taste to the soul, quick energy for the body. Let's read that. I mean, that's a, that's a great verse to memorize. This is a great verse for marriage relationships. I'll be talking to a couple that I'm doing their wedding this week. I'll be using this verse. Glorious speech, read it with me. Glorious speech is like clover honey, good taste to the soul and quick energy for the body. Every once in a while, I'll go to the cabinet. I have my own private jar of honey. Everybody knows that I'm going to stick a spoon in there, and I'm going to dip it out, and, and I may get one or two teaspoons, but it's amazing. The honey just lifts me up. It picks me up. It's a quick energy shot, but it, also, since it's local honey, it gives me some nutrients that I need to help protect me from you know, any respiratory things or things like that in our community. However, the Bible says too much honey is bad for you because think about that word energy. How many of you have ever drank too much Mountain Dew? How many of you have ever drank too much Red Bull? How many of you have ever drank too much coffee? And you just, you, you, I wasn't really asking you to raise your hands on that, but confession is good for the soul. <laughs> You know, I've read of gamers dying from heart attacks because they drank too many Red Bulls. We got a man in the church that told me he had to quit drinking them because they, he just got addicted to them. Listen, there's, you may get too much honey, but you'll never get too much encouragement. You may get too much honey, but you'll never get too much grace. And so we need to learn how to give grace. So my question is, who gives grace to you? Who gives grace to you? And my follow-up is, who are you giving grace to? Who are you giving grace to? And then thirdly this morning, be truthful, but be kind. Be truthful. Be honest, but be kind. Don't flatter people. The Bible says if you flatter someone, you're laying a snare for their feet. You're trying to trip them up. They want something from you. Those three meals I left yesterday, I didn't feel flattered. Matter of fact, I was challenged at every one of those meals that I was talking about. But I did leave encouraged. I did leave replenished. As a matter of fact, I showed someone something that I was working on, uh, and my, I pulled out my mind map, and I said, would you just take a look at this? And if I'm missing something, if I'm not defining reality correctly, I need you to be truthful. I don't need affirmation. I'm very confident, but I just need you to be truthful. And I, I stepped away to get something to drink, and when I came back, he looked at me, and he says, when I look at that mind map, I see you. I see your heart. I see your passion. This is all you, and it, it, I found, you know, by being willing to submit my life to somebody else to take a look at it and say, give me your honest opinion on this. You see, you can define reality. You can be truthful, and you can be kind and encouraging. How many of you have ever had somebody to be truthful with you, and you felt judged and you felt condemned when they were truthful with you? Yeah. They've come, they, they've hit you with the truth. They punch you. Maybe they even cloak it like this. They go, I just want to tell you this in love, and you immediately go like this. I mean, anytime somebody tells me they're going to tell me in love, I just start getting ready to protect my vitals. I know I'm fixing to get knifed. But people can be truthful and kind because they come alongside of you and they go, look, I want to help you see the truth. I want to help you see reality and I'm willing to walk with you 
to get there. But if I don't confront you on this, I fear it's going to destroy you. If I don't confront you on this, I fear it's going to hurt you. I, if I don't confront you, it's going to hurt other people around you. So they're truthful. But when you are, somebody tells you the truth and you feel judged or you feel condemned or you want to protect your vitals, there's a saying going around now, you've just been truthed. You've just been truthed. And what truth means is that somebody has come along and they have judged you, they have condemned you, and they're ready to hang you. They're not there to help you. All of us at some point in our life, we felt judged, we felt beat up, we felt ashamed. So we end up not using the truth that comes our way. You see, when you, now don't miss, follow, this is real important. Because if we feel beat up, if we feel ashamed, or if we feel like somebody is condemning us, rather than receiving the truth, it could help us, we, we back away. We, we, we run because we're afraid of being hurt. We're afraid of being destroyed. Or else we're like the Pharisees. We just bow up and say, hey, I'm more righteous. I don't do this. I don't do that. Or we're like the Sadducees. We try to change what the Word of God says. But if we're truthful and kind, people will listen to us. It's why they listen to Jesus. Because He gave them truth but he gave it to them with kindness. Look at John 1.17. The law was given by Moses, but Jesus Christ brought us undeserved kindness and truth. Now look at this. Don't let this, you go, I know this. Jesus brought us undeserved kindness and truth. Jesus gave you kindness before he gave you truth. Say it with me. Jesus gave me kindness before he gave me truth. One more time. Jesus gave me kindness before he gave me truth. People listen to kind people. Proverbs 19, 20 says, Get all the advice and instruction you can so that you will be wise the rest of your life. I want all the instruction. I want all the truth. I'm a learner. I daily try to learn. I daily write something in my journal that I've learned that day. I try to learn every day. But I find myself learning not from the critics, but learning from those who are kind. So my third question, who's being truthful with you but kind? Who helps define reality in your life? And then my second question is, who are you being truthful with? But they're listening to you because you're kind. And then finally this morning, be invested before you give advice. Be invested. Put skin in the game before you give advice. I've probably shared this illustration 20 times at Woodland over the, this sounds going to sound long, over nearly the quarter of a century that I've been your pastor. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like a long time? The full meaning of that phrase hit me right between the eyes this week. We've walked together for nearly a quarter of a century, over 23 years. But this illustration, it never loses its punch to me. I'm in a hotel room. There's a little boy caught in a canal during a flash flood in L.A. You may have saw this on CNN. I'm mesmerized by it. People are on the banks of the canal. They're putting out sticks. They're throwing life preservers out with ropes. They're trying to help the little boy get back to safety. He just fell in, and he's being swept away, and he's going to drown. And, but nobody's getting in the water with him. And finally, a, a first responder helicopter comes down and is flying over the boy, and they're sticking poles. They're sticking nets. They're putting rafts and things that they're trying to get the little boy. And finally, the little boy is just giving up. He's weak. He's tired. And one of the firefighters dives in with all the gear on. He dives in, and he grabs the little boy. And fortunately, he's strong enough to swim against the current 
Davidson to get to the side, and he saved the little boy, and I'm standing in front of the TV going over and over in my spirit, that's Jesus, that's Jesus. Jesus didn't just watch us from heaven in our struggle. He left the throne room of glory. He dove into this world of sin. He dove into this world of brokenness. He dove into this world of misconception, and he rescued us by coming and not only showing us vertically what God is like, but showing us how to live among us and we celebrate this Palm Sunday and this Easter Sunday, Christ became one of us. Somebody give him a hand of praise this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus had skin in the game. You say, Pastor, how do I do that? I can only tell you how I do it. People come through every Sunday and whisper in my ear, will you pray for this? Will you pray for that? Typically, I always say, will you text me and remind me? And then between the services, I do what I did this morning. I go straight to my office. I write down as much as I can remember and then hope the other people text me. And I keep my word. Look at me. I keep my word. And I pray. Sometimes I send a verse of Scripture. I'm putting skin in the game. It's one thing to tell them at the door, to tell them at the altar, to tell you from the pulpit that I'm praying for you. I want skin in the game. And I find people suddenly find hope and encouragement. And they don't feel alone because I want to be willing to be present in their life. This has always been my prayer. If I write you something personally, I usually put Colossians 1, 28, 29. I do labor with everything within me to preach the gospel. But I remember when God made this scripture real to me. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the lamb with a curse. I want to see parents' hearts turn toward their children and children's hearts turn towards their parents. And it takes time to parent this way. I want to see husbands and wives with their hearts turn towards one another. I want our church to be turned towards the heart of lost people. That's what we mean by celebrating God's love, by persuading lost people to become passionate followers of Christ. And I want to see their hearts turn towards us. Then the Bible says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says, or otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. So my final question to you this morning is, who doesn't just give you advice, but they're in the game with you? They're walking through this season of life with you. At the first of the message, I ask you, who could use more energy? Who could use more faith? Who could use more peace? Who could use more of a positive mental attitude? And across the room and in the first service across the room, we all confess we need that in our lives. Who's doing that with you and who are you doing that? Look at me. Look at me. Don't miss this. But who are you doing that for this week? Let me go back to the pastor I was talking about. He's a great man. He's in heaven now, but he was a great man, and I loved him dearly. But I told him what I'm going to tell you. It takes three, four, five logs to build a good fire. But if I pull one log out of that roaring fire and pull it off by itself, that log is going to die. It's not me and Jesus got our own thing going. It's not me and Jesus got our own thing worked out. I need that vertical, but I need people in my life as well. If Jesus said, my soul is crushed, there are going to be times in my life, in my wife's life, in your life, maybe our life as a congregation, your children's life, 
where we're going to need somebody to be present. And I've decided that I want you and me and this church to be the Titus that greatly encourages others. Can you say amen? Stand with me this morning. I want to pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you help us to learn how just to be present, not to judge, but just to be present, just to be willing to sit and pray how I remember the touch of those hands and those prayers. Father, secondly, I ask you to help us give grace to one another. To give to others what they may not deserve, but to give out of what we've been given. I ask you to help us to be truthful, but be kind. Help us to define reality, but be kind. And then finally, Lord, to put some skin in the game, to be willing to walk with someone, whether it's with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, or whether it's with Paul when he was greatly discouraged and distressed, or whether, Lord, it was a woman caught in adultery, our Father, where there was a lame man who cried out, have mercy, have mercy. Father, make us that kind of people. And when every head is bowed and every eye is closed, and those that are watching online today, I'm so glad you're with us. And those that are here, if you've not given your life to Jesus, he loves you. And so on this Palm Sunday, I'm inviting you to give your heart to Christ. Christ has already accepted you. He's already forgiven you. It's just up to you to receive what God has done in your life. So would you pray this prayer with me? Just pray it honestly. Just pray it quietly if you want to, or you can pray it out loud. But say, Heavenly Father, thank you for showing me the wealth of your kindness. Through the blood of your Son, so that my sins could be forgiven. I don't understand it all, but as much as I know how, I receive you into my heart and life as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord make you the people who give grace. May the Lord make you the people that are willing to be present. May the Lord make you the people that are willing to define reality and yet be kind about it. And may God make us willing to take up our cross and put skin in the game. And may God in turn bless us with people that will be all these things with us and for us to the glory of God. In Jesus' name I pray. God bless you. Go in peace and happy Palm Sunday.